Okay, welcome to the Crow Discovery Project. Um, I've been shooting nonstop, and I just haven't, this is the longest stretch I've gone without shooting anything. Uh, this clip's going to be about the new scope, which I just received the replacement. Here's the two boxes. <laughs> that bottom box weighs just under 200 pounds. Um, at any rate, I probably will edit another clip together of some satellites I shot tomorrow. Um, but this clip is going to show the new equipment, particularly the new scope. And here is the very buff field tripod, uh, which has been part of the problem. This one is the second, and it will need to be replaced again as it is not level. Um, so Mead has stood up, and they are dealing with this. You can see here it's not level when it's set up, and uh, that's a problem. So I've still got another one coming that will be correct. And here is the interface plate on the bottom of the scope. At any rate, uh, kick back. This is an interesting clip, and this is cool equipment. Okay, here is the new telescope. Um, it's an LX600. It's nearly twice the size of my old 8-inch. Um, I'll film. I'm going to film some of the things as I put it together so you can see all that it does. Um, this is really cool. This bottom part of the focuser is like a coarse focus. Actually, let me see, am I in focus? I don't know, but anyhow, um, I'm a little too close. This is the fine focus up here, and it's kind of cool. Uh, it's very precision, and I've got a little tool uh, that I made. And actually, I'll show you the tool. Let me see here. I've just kind of got a pile of stuff i got to put together here. Here's the little tool. So I'll make a better one of these, but you make a tool like this and it takes the vibration out. When you put the camera on the back every little jiggle um, gets translated onto the video so you make a little thing and this is just a cheapie that I made so that I can use it and it allows you to find focus which is really cool and it takes the jiggle out. But anyhow let me get some of the components going. Okay so the first thing is the viewfinder and it's kind of cool. Uh, this viewfinder is kind of advanced compared to my other one because you've got this kind of zoom capability and focus capability. Um, this is actually better than the classic 200 one. You tighten these up and then you're going to do your alignment with those screws and I'll mount it up here. So, so this is the finder that I'm installing. It's got a little lock back here so it can't fall out the back. Uh, the little thumb screws are plastic, but in a way, it's kind of better for this, I think, to have than metal ones. The Starlock has metal ones, and I'll show you that as I do it. All right, this is the really cool part about the scope. This is the Starlock system, and what this does is basically allows everything to be automated because what you have is a system in here with a wide view and a narrow view that acquires a star, identifies it, and then locks on that star to make sure that you track. So when you're setting up, the cool thing about it is that it goes and finds the star you need to do your initial setup. Then when you're looking at things, it keeps you locked right on the uh, target. And this thing works. It's almost incredible how it works. Anyhow. All right, and this is where the star lock mounts. And the star lock has all steel. Um, this is all metal screws and things to, actually I want to do this kind of evenly. And I want to make sure that that's butted all the way up. And one of the things with the star lock is like when you want to manually sight, you look down the top of your sight like a, or the top of your scope like a gun barrel and this kind of blocks that so I kind of wish that they had offset uh, the star lock but anyhow it's a pretty simple mount just two screws and then uh, you just tighten it a little and the star lock is mounted and there are two ports here uh, I think I only need to use one of them for standard use but I'll have to to read the manual and uh, you can see let me uh, you can see um, it's got its own little caps on the wide field and even a little tiny cap on the little narrow lock portion of it, so it's pretty cool. Okay, so this is kind of 
a big improvement from my classic. This is the weight system that counterbalances your telescope and it goes right here on this rail um, and the cool thing is that you can slide it anywhere you need it so when you have your camera system hanging off the back of this thing um, if you have eyepieces it could be out to here really pulling down the back of the scope if it's just the camera it's up here so these weights allow you to balance the scope really well and I'll show you how it works okay so they just kind of slide on and this is all steel so it's really heavy duty and I won't be able to place them until I uh, get the camera and stuff on then I'll do the balancing routine but it locks everything has a hex key on this whole system so you have about four hex keys that do basically everything and come on so I'll just rough place these for now, make sure they're tight so they don't slide, and those are installed. Okay. okay, this is another cool feature uh, that's new to this scope. Um, these are vibration pads, and they go under the tripod. I'll just open one of them so you can see, but they really work. Um, this scope is so heavy when it's on concrete or something, when you walk by, every little jiggle translates into your filming and they have created these um, and what they do is absorb vibration and they actually work uh, using the old scope if we walk by even if the dog walked by it we could see the jiggle with these things under the tripod you don't see anything so it's very cool alright so this is what connects the uh, the scope motors these multi pin connectors go from here to here they jump and actually the scope breaks down right here if I didn't want to lift this whole fork arm I could break the scope in half and just lift the tube in this portion but anyhow there's a connection here and here and a connection here and here okay and those just screw in like a typical computer multi-connector it's actually very simple and pretty precision very easy which is cool and you know on the old scope you have those like, I forget what they call them, like R jacks to like a telephone, old style telephone cable. Um, these are much better. Um, they lock tighter and they snap right in and snap right out. Okay. Um, okay, so this is the, the control panel and one of the cool features on the 600s is you get a hook up here which turns this into a virtual computer port which means I can jack the scope straight into my PC and that allows me to do all kinds of things and uh, also and this is one of the things I wasn't crazy about there's a power supply but it doesn't come with the scope you have to buy the AC power separately um, the classic LX100s had their own power supply and what they do is they when you ship there's these little things in here that allow you believe it or not to put D cell batteries and I can't get it open uh. anyhow these little things open up there's two of them and I think it's like eight or ten D cells going here and you can power your scope in the field which I guess that's kinda cool um, but it, it just seems like the AC power should come standard with this so yeah. um, and here is the handset um, called Auto Star. Actually I'm open it. Look the plastic is already scuffed up. But whatever. I have actually a backup of these. And the Auto Star uh, is a pretty amazing thing. It gives you all kinds of uh, like hundreds of thousands of objects you can find. And uh, which am I going into? Oops that's the wrong one. And it just plugs in like that. Um, the only other thing I don't like is there's this little silly holder for the handset. We're just going to put Velcro on the back and stick it to the leg like this. But this Auto Star is very cool. Um, the keys are very responsive and the slew speed has nine speeds. It's cool. You push one and you can select all the way up to nine, nine being the fastest. So that's your slewing or tracking speed. Um, the classic model only has three speeds. Um, so yeah, that's pretty cool. Okay, and so here is the aperture, and again, I really like the cover here. It's tight and firm and airtight, 
so airtight, in fact. Um, that's kind of not cool. But anyhow, you can see the aperture of the scope. It collects many hundred times the light of the 8-inch scope, nearly twice as big, not quite. Um, and the optics are incredible. You'll notice that uh, it says ACF in here, and what it means is you see a lot of people shoot the moon and the edge will be all messed up. That's called chromatic aberration, and all consumer-grade optics have it. And what this means is that it's sharp, clear, no chromatic aberration all the way to the edges of your field of view. And um, try to shoot. I'll tilt it towards the light, see if you can shoot down inside the tube. Can you see in there? at all? Yeah, well I can see a bunch of mirrors. Yeah, so, yeah, so there's that. Okay, so right here is the GPS module and when you fire up to do the star lock it basically it figures out a lot of things. As a matter of fact, if the, if the base of this telescope is not level um, it actually figures out digitally what level is, which is a bit mind-boggling. Uh, but the GPS, you know, I have mixed feelings about it. It's phone and home all the time, which isn't great. But the point is it makes the whole process much easier. Um, other than that, that's pretty much the scope. Um, it does have the same, you know, all as rings and all that stuff um, that the other scope had. And uh, it's just very precision. And the main thing is the optics are just mind-blowing. And, uh, you know, for a light bucket, which is basically what this is, this is just a light bucket. It collects light, and uh, I, I have a, a lot of ability I didn't have before. So much so that when I shoot the moon now, it's actually difficult to balance the camera uh, looking at such a bright object. I may have to get some filters to knock down the surface brightness of the moon. But there it is. Okay, and so this is the new telephoto lens. Um, 80, I think it's 80 to 600, I'm forgetting, yeah, 80, 80 to 600. Um, so for daytime shots, the quality and distance that we were able to shoot has gone way up. Um, we haven't seen chemtrails in many weeks now, so I don't know what's going on with that. But just also in comparison, um, I'll show you the old 8 inch so you can kind of see it almost looks like a toy now compared to the new scope and <laughs> here's the old 8 inch and it's just you know it seems tiny now in comparison but this scope is fantastic I'll never get rid of the scope and it is the scope that first captured the lunar wave so it's uh, special to me on a few counts and there it is okay so a bunch of people have sent me their images uh, crow triple seven supporters uh, they've been to cafe press and got some gear Here's my buddy Demetrius who does deep space photography and I may be running some more of his imagery soon. Uh, he does some really good work and he's just getting started. Here's my friend Doug with his cool classic mini. Uh, sent me this image uh, maybe a week and a half, two weeks ago. Here we have DV McGovern. We have chatted on YouTube. That's a good looking shirt. I really like that gray long sleeve with the, uh, the black logo. And I haven't got one yet, but I'll have to soon. Here's my friend Gary Edmore, who is often on Facebook uh, trying to spread awareness about chemtrails. Uh, I understand his grandchildren may get these shirts soon. And here is Susanna Kentrick, who I've also chatted with on, uh, on Facebook. And that is a good looking shirt. So I will continue to shoot. I'm in my longest dry spell to date of not shooting anything, and we have not seen chemtrails in many weeks, which is nothing to complain about. But uh, there it is. Cheers.